hepatitis C patients offer, often suffer from depression. Most often that's prevalent in patients taking pegylated interferon. Uh, some of the newer treatments can be used without interferon and that may lead to decreased incidence. But are, are there standard screening programs for de depression in, in hep C patients? And I'll throw that open to the group. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's um, standard protocols of questions that you should be asking patients um, at your touch points. Um, and, you know, the interesting part or, or the challenging part is when, when the patient does uh, identify themselves or, or perceive to have depression, you know, you notify the prescriber and then um, the options that are available um, come back to the oral high cost uh, dual agents. Yeah, and I, I think you've, uh, you know, if a patient has to, re, you know, remain on that pegylated interferon, suffers from de depression, uh, what are those options? Just really the new products like Carvoni, or is there is there a way to stay on the pegylated interferon and still treat the depression? You know, prior to these products, I mean, there were there were um, uh, opportunities, or there were um, you know uh, avenues that you could approach, but now with the risk reward, um, I think just about every prescriber is going to. Uh, offer the new the new agents. And I think it's important to note that um, depression screening is important not only in hepatitis C but also in any other chronic condition because of the high risk for non-adherence if a patient does suffer from depression as well. Um, at MHA in our clinical therapy management program we actually use the National Institutes of Health com preferred community mental health depression screening questionnaire and um, every program has sort of their own preferred method of screening for depression. You know, you know, hepatitis C is getting to be a crowded space with a lot of uh, pro products that work very well. Um, and several competitors will have similar efficacy with SVR. Uh, what's the incentive that will drive the regimen to a certain product? Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on what will make one product successful over another? Cheryl? I think ultimately it's going to be real world outcomes, and that's going to be the uh, uh, SVRs. And at this point, it will be. Um, self-reported SVRs or uh, health plan mandated uh, follow-up SVR. Do we, go ahead, I'm sorry. No. Oh, no, I was just going to agree with that. And I think as a component of a compliance program or adherence program for these drugs, I, I think that needs to be an added component at the end is to, you know, have that follow-up with the patient to remind them, you know, patient call reminder and, and make sure that they're getting that, you know, SVR at, you know, 12 weeks following the end of their therapy. Um, I think wh what's really going to be important is, um, in terms of um, the payers, is looking at are the drugs really equivalent? So, you know, the real world outcomes are going to be important, but also you want to give your members their best chance to um, be adherent and achieve this cure rate. So, um, having products that are going to be easy to take and, and a regimen that's going to be relatively easy is going to have uh, some impact as well. If products are equal in safety and efficacy, will formulary design come into play? Absolutely. I mean, that, that's where it will probably lay at the end, at the end of the day. I, I think the other thing that's important here is, is uh, prior treatments and patient history. Um, you know, having been in the hep, B, hep uh, C space for years, um, it, it's really a benefit um, when, when we see a, a patient coming in, it happens, it's a new referral, but it's not really a new patient. And we have years of history of what they've tried and failed. And that helps with choosing the appropriate um, product and, and then length of therapy. Absolutely. You know, when you look at Harvoni, um, if you are treatment experienced, then, and you have cirrhosis, and then your treatment duration becomes 24 weeks. So I think that that complete patient assessment has to happen up front. Um, and I will even mention that um, originally the ASLD um, did produce, you know, guidelines for treatment of hepatitis C. They have always, and they updated them most recently. Um, but their main recommendation is to treat all patients infected with um, hepatitis C. However, at the end of September, they did revise um, the recommendations to include language to address how to prioritize patients. So I think uh, that's something that we all need to think about is that, you know, is this uh, a way to help contain some of this cost? So, you know, understanding who are the patients we need to treat, maybe who are the patients we need to treat first and, and use the money for those patients first. You know, these drugs are so highly.